Good morning, this is Dr. Nitya, uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Today we'll be dealing one of the uh, important late pregnancy complications that is antipartum hemorrhage. So what is antipartum hemorrhage? It is defined as bleeding from or into the genital tract that occurs from 28 weeks of pregnancy and prior to the birth of the baby. So any bleeding that occurs in pregnancy that is from the genital tract due to any cause that occurs in the late um, trimester, that is the third trimester, which starts from 28 weeks till the delivery of the baby, then it is categorized as antipartum hemorrhage. So any bleeding that occurs before this is considered to be a miscarriage or um, in India, the period of viability is from 28 weeks of pregnancy. That is, only if the bleeding occurs more than this period of gestation, then the baby is uh, probably uh, capable of surviving outside the womb. But anything that occurs before 28 weeks of pregnancy is categorized as miscarriage as the baby cannot independently survive if delivered at any point before 28 weeks of gestation in India. So that's why it is this cutoff of 28 weeks is taken for definitely antipartum hemorrhage. So what is the incidence? It complicates around two, three to five percentage of all the pregnancies. So when you take all the maternal deaths, there are so many causes, but this cause of hemorrhage causes up to 50 percentage of the maternal deaths that occur globally each year. So what are the main causes of antipartum hemorrhage? One important cause will be placental abduction and the other important cause is placenta previa, which we will be covering in detail in this class. Other uh, simple causes also have to be known. So what is placental abduction? It is a condition where there is premature separation of a normally situated placenta. So this is a normal location of the placenta that is upper uterine segment. So normal placental separation happens in third stage of labor that is after the delivery of the baby. But in case due to any other cause if it is separating prematurely that is before the delivery of the baby anytime during pregnancy or in labor then it is called as placental abduction and because of this separation there could be bleeding which is uh, sometimes seen externally or many times seen externally as bleeding per vagina. So this contributes to around 40 percentage of the antipartum hemorrhage and if we take overall pregnancies then around 0.3 percentage of pregnancies are prone to develop placental abruption. This is one important cause and the other cause is placenta premier which we also will be discussing in detail in this class. There are other unidentified causes or unclassified causes which are usually due to local genital lesions um, which can cause bleeding during pregnancy. So one is show. Show is actually not a bleeding. It is a mixture of mucoid discharge from the cervix and it could be blood stained at some of the uh, times. It's usually a sign of early labor that we see. So that could be mistaken as antipartum hemorrhage. Other local causes in the uh, cervix include any inflammation uh, which could be acute or chronic, that is cervicitis, or if there is any trauma, say in the form of even minor trauma like coital injury can also cause bleeding from the genital tract. And there are rare conditions like valval varicosity, similar to varicosity in the testes or in the lower limb. These varicosities can get ulcerated and then give uh, bleeding for vagina. So there could be another genital tumors which could be vascular like hemangiomas or even could be malignancies of the genital tract like vulva, vagina or cervix which can cause bleeding from the genital tract. Other uh, causes not exactly antipartum hemorrhage but sometimes even hematuria the patient can mistakenly report as antipartum hemorrhage because they are not exactly sure about from where is the geni uh, genital bleeding occurring from. Even in genital infections uh, due to chlamydia, trochomitis or trichomonas vaginalis, there could be a strawberry vagina or inflammation of the cervix and vagina, which can cause bleeding at some point. 
and there are other uh, placental and uh, cord related conditions like vasa previa so vasa previa is nothing but uh, a condition where there is a leash of vessels if you see just above the cervix they are attached to a membrane instead of the placenta itself so whenever there is rupture of membranes there is profuse vaginal bleeding in these cases and this can lead to severe fetal distress so these are conditions where immediate intervention is required so out of these all these conditions the two things which are very important are as i told you one is placental abruption and second is placenta previa so that will be discussed in detail placenta previa is a condition where the placenta is implanted wholly or partially in the lower uterine segment so the normal location of placenta is in the upper uterine segment because uh, that is a naturally quiescent part of the uterus even during labor if the lower segment undergoes contraction and retraction the placenta is not disturbed but this is a condition where the placenta is implanted in the lower uterine segment and the incidence is reported to be 3.4 to 4.6 per 1000 pregnancies so what are the causes which can cause the placenta to get implanted in the lower uterine segment so these are the risk factors whenever this is the most important risk factor when we anticipate placenta previa that is occurrence of placenta previa in the previous pregnancy and the other important factor is previous cesarean section so these are nothing but in any of these conditions the endometrium is or the myometrium is weakened and so there is other uh, there is a chance that the placenta may get attached to that weak area multiparity again why multiparity means uh, there is increasing number of pregnancies so with increasing number of pregnancy again uh, even though it is a normal delivery or cesarean section there is a higher risk of developing placenta previa smoking smoking will cause hyperplacentosis because of estrogen deficiency so these are the main uh, risk factors where there is a defective uterine wall or whenever the placenta is very large it cannot accommodate completely in the upper uterine segment so it goes to the lower uterine segment naturally advanced maternal age and multiple pregnancy naturally because there are two going to be two placentas or one placenta which is larger than the usual placenta so that also has a higher risk of getting implanted in the lower uterine segment and compared to natural conceptions assisted conceptions have a higher risk of developing placenta previa so these are the conditions given in the box again uh, they contribute to a common cause known as defective uterine wall that is any scar in the uterine um, tissue it could be a lsc scar or it could be a myomectomy scar or it could be a previous rupture which was repaired so anything will uh, weaken the uterine wall endometritis is nothing but infection of the endometrial layers of the uterus so again it causes defect uh, defective healing and uh, there is a more chance of developing placenta previa so whenever manual removal was done or when uh, the curettage was done over seamlessly to remove the whole of the endometrium or if there is a subnucleus fibroid all this is going to weaken the uterine wall and there is a higher chance that the placenta may get implanted on to these weak areas in the lower uterine segment so when we classify the types of placenta previa earlier it was classified as four types that is type 1 2 3 and 4 depending upon the uh, distance from the internal wall so type 1 or the mild variety is a low lying placenta which encroaches on the lower uterine segment but it does not reach the internal wall and marginal placenta so how is type 1 placenta different from a normal placenta it is usually the, uh, so it is usually uh, the placenta is located more than 5 cm from the internal wall but in uh, low lying placenta type 1 it is within 5 cm from the internal wall but it is away from the margin of the wall type 2 or marginal placenta previa means mar uh, placenta reaches the margin of the internal wall but it does not cover it at any point 
So this is also better, but um, there are again two types in it which we'll see. Type three is partial placenta previa when it partially covers the internal walls. So what is partially covering? So it covers the internal walls when it is closed, but when the patient starts dilating in labor and the walls gets dilated, then it only partially covers the walls. Type 4 is nothing but the worst variety or complete placenta premia, where the placenta covers the host completely even when the host is open fully. That means that the placenta is generally in the, uh, generally covering the whole of internal host. Type 1 and type 2A are minor degrees of placenta previa. Type 2B, A, type 3 and type 4 are classified as major degree because uh, this, is, this classification is mainly for the management of labor in minor degree or up to type 2A. You can allow them for a vaginal delivery because it is not going to bleed when they dilate. Whereas type 2, B3 and 4, they are major degrees and we recommend cesarean section as a mode of delivery in such patients. So what is type 2, A and B? Type 2 is marginal where it reaches up to the margin of the internals. So A and B are nothing but anterior and posterior. When it is type 2, anterior, it is called type 2, A. And when it is posterior, type 2, it is called type 2, B. So you can see the pictorial description. This is the placenta type 1. It is in the lowest segment only, but it's still away from the internal pores. It is not anywhere near the margin of the internal pores. This is the internal pores. And type 2 is marginal, where it reaches up to the margin of the internal pores. Type 3 is this red placental tissue is reaching and covering the horse partially. But still, when the patient dilates, uh, this may not be completely covered. And type 4 or complete placenta previa is like this. It covers the horse completely even when it is dilated. So what is dangerous placenta previa? Dangerous placenta previa is type 2 B where the placenta is located in the posterior aspect. So why is it called dangerous? Because it is going to shorten the anteroposterior diameter because if it is type 2B posterior, then it is directly going to sit on the sacral bay. So the anteroposterior diameter of the pelvic inlet itself is reduced. So whenever the head tries to get engaged, there's going to be fetal heart deceleration and uh, this in this condition, labor cannot progress. So it is called as type 2 dangerous placenta previa, type 2B. So this is a newer classification that has come up. This is, put, uh, this is called as DASH classification 2013. So now they have removed all the four types. It is only divided into placenta previa or a low level placenta. It's called placenta previa and the internal loss is covered partially or completely by the placenta. That is type 2 or 3. Sorry, three or four, and low lying placenta is nothing but implantation onto the lower uterine segment. But still, there is a wide margin around the internal nose, around two centimeter per meter. So this is the ultrasound picture for uh, plas for diagnosing the placenta previa. It is important that we do a transvaginal ultrasound. Otherwise, we cannot make out the exact distance from the internal nose. So you can see that this is the cervical canal. This is the head of the fetus and this is the placenta. So usually the placenta is not seen when you do a TVS because it is going to be in the upper uterine segment. Here it is coming below the placental head and it is almost reaching up to the margin of the internal pores. So this is like type 2 placenta previa. What is the pathophysiology due to the shearing forces to the placental attachment in the lower uterine segment? Um, it is also associated with the development of your lower uterine segment in third trimester. That's why most of the patients with placenta previa they are raised symptomatic till the third trimester. Only in the third trimester, when the lower uterine segment forms start forming, there is the shearing forces that are acting, and that leads to uh, hemorrhage in pregnancy. And also 
more uh, chances of bleeding when uterine contractions start and uh, they dilate the cervix. When separation is also provoked by unwise digital vaginal examination. So suppose if the examining gynecologist doesn't know where is the placenta before doing a pelvic examination and accidentally disrupts the placenta while doing a digital vaginal examination, they start bleeding profusely. So this is the pathophysiology behind the bleeding. The uterus is also unable to contract adequately to stop flow from the open vessels. So there is a phenomenon called placental migration. If you take an uh, antenatal woman in early trimester, you can see that the placenta, incidence of placenta previa is very, very high. Like around 90 to 97 percentage of low-lying placenta at 16 to 22 weeks become normal at term. So when does this happen? If you take a uh, term, I told it's only 0.3 percentage of incidence of placenta previa. So as the gestational age advances, the placental uh, uh, previa incidence usually comes down but how does this happen it does not move the placenta does not as such move it's only a uh, apparent movement so this apparent movement could be because of development of lower uterine segment in the later part of pregnancy so the placenta grows preferentially towards a better vascularized fundus trophotropism and uh, the placenta over less vascularized cervix undergoes atrophy. So the upper part of the uterus or the fundus of the uterus has a better vascularity than the lower uterine segment. So what happens is more of the placental tissue grows towards the upper segment and that in the lower segment undergoes atrophy. This gives an apparent movement of the placenta. So whenever we diagnose placenta previa in the early trimester, we just have to warn them. Uh, but that, but you have to uh, reassure them that many of the times it may move up, but uh, they need a repeat follow-up ultrasound at around 32 to 34 weeks to confirm that uh, where the location of the placenta. So diagnosis. Clinically, when the patient comes to you in third trimester with bleeding, which is usually painless, costless, recurrent bouts in late second or early third trimester, then you suspect placenta previa. The first bleed is usually a warning bleed or a sentinel bleed. That is, it is not as severe as um, how it will be in the second episode. So the first episode, the patient should be admitted and uh, managed accordingly to avoid the second um, profuse hemorrhage. When the, ble the bleeding is also usually slight, uh, but sometimes it could be even profuse. And the color of the bleeding will be bright red in color. Sometimes they just uh, present to us with premature preterm rupture of membranes, but the patient will have a blood stained like a. And uh, in an exam in the abdomen, the uterus is usually relaxed. It corresponds to the period of gestation. It is painless and relaxed and non tender also. So, what is a, a common associated finding is malpresentation because usually the head of the fetus is bigger than the podalic pole of the fetus. So whenever the placenta is in the normal position, that is in the upper segment, and this baby is in the normal position, cephalic position, but when the placenta is in the lower uterine segment, the bigger head is not able to occupy the lower uterine segment, so it grows up and the podalic pole comes down. So man presentation is a common association up to at least one third of the cases. So a per speculum examination is done to rule out other causes of the uh, bleeding like uh, cervical or cervical polyp or cervical tumors uh, or to see if the horse is dilated. So all this can be done uh, for speculum examination but never do a per vaginal examination unless you confirm the position of the uh, placenta by doing an ultrasound in a patient with antipartum hemorrhage. So stall worthy sign is just for theoretical purpose. This is nothing but when you press the fundus of the uterus. The head of the fetus dips in and so there could be uh, fetal heart decelerations that you know which will all uh, again pick up if when you leave the fundus of the uterus. This is not demonstrated these days. It is um, Earlier they used to diagnose placenta previa with all these signs but now we have much more better options to diagnose.
the investigation wise, uh, first and foremost is ultrasound. As I told you, it will be a transvaginal ultrasound that we do. Routine ultrasound screening at 20 weeks of gestation when we do an anomaly scan should also include a placental localization. Because in early scan, it may not be still uh, confirmed, but in mid trimester, we can very make out the location of the placenta. So, transvaginal sonography is safe and the results are superior. So once the patient comes to us with bleeding, what exactly has to be done? Immediate management will be to admit the patient because any bleeding in pregnancy needs hospital monitoring. There is no outpatient management. Uh, we have to assess the general condition and the amount of blood loss. That is first, secure a good IV line, uh, that is white door cannula, and send the necessary investigations like blood grouping, typing, arrange for cross-matched blood, and uh, till you get the uh, if if there is a good amount of blood loss and there is a unstable vital say the patient is having tachycardia and hypertension, immediate management will be to give IV fluids, can give up to one liter per hour and then arrange the blood. So as soon as you give the blood, you can start resuscitating the volume by uh, cross-matched blood. So the first step in any antipartum hemorrhage will be to resuscitate and stabilize the mother and then go for the diagnosis why she started bleeding. That will be done when we do an ultrasound. Then we can go on to the fetal monitoring, preferably using a cardiotomograph. So in placenta previa, as I told you, uh, the many of the times the bleeding is usually minimal and so we can uh, continue the pregnancy if the patient is not uh, termed. So we have to confirm the fetal viability and fetal well-being by doing a cardiotomogram. Then we can decide upon the uh, management further, whether we are going to conservatively manage the patient and continue her pregnancy or we are going to terminate the pregnancy by delivering the patient. Again, if we are deciding about delivery, we have to decide between vaginal delivery and cesarean section. So this decision depends on the gestational age. Suppose the patient has completed 37 weeks, then there is no point in prolonging the pregnancy as the fetus of uh, lung maturity is already complete. So we can directly go on uh, for termination of the pregnancy. Suppose it's a preterm pregnancy which has not completed 37 weeks, then if the mother uh, is stable and the baby is doing well and the bleeding is limited, uh, you can follow a conservative management which has a name that is McCafe and Johnson's regimen where you admit the patient and give her complete bed rest and uh, transfusion support to maintain the hemoglobin, hemoglobin more than 10 gram. Also arrange a donor and keep blood in reserve. So uh, meanwhile, we can give uh, steroids for the lung maturity of the baby. Propolysis is very controversial, generally not given unless uh, the steroid uh, needs some time to act but in general it is not preferred to give so there should be close monitoring of the maternal vitals bleeding and the fetal well-being by using a cardiotopogram and if the patient is rh negative then we have to give prophylactic dose of anti-d injection after confirming that the indirect pooms test is negative so this uh, conservative management of a patient with bleeding who has placenta previa and it is preterm is called as McCafe Johnson regimen. So if all goes good, you can continue this up to 37 weeks and then decide about the date of delivery. So placenta previa has to be delivered by 36 to 37 completed weeks, and there are some conditions for placenta accreta where the low-lying placenta is completely adherent with the uterine wall. There is no plane of separation between the placenta and the uterine wall. Such patients have to be delivered by cesarean section only and it has to be done at a much earlier period than placenta previa alone that is 34 to 35 completed weeks.
So what are the indications for doing cesarean section in placenta previa? As I told you, for all major degree placenta previa, that is type 2B, type 3 and type 4, we have to do in the cesarean section. Or when the patient is having a profuse bleeding and you cannot uh, resuscitate the patient and stabilize the vitals anytime, you have to terminate the pregnancy immediately by doing a cesarean section. And other uh, adherent placenta syndromes like placenta accreta also, we have to do a cesarean section. Okay, how do we go about with the uh, pre-operative preparation? So pre-operative preparation is nothing but um, getting ready for massive hemorrhage. So obviously it has to be carried out in a unit with blood bank and facilities for a high dependency unit because even with her best efforts, the patient can undergo, I mean, can uh, have a postpartum hemorrhage or a severe antipartum hemorrhage when you are preparing her for a cesarean section. So arrange adequate blood and blood products and only then take her up for a cesarean section or you can refer the patient to a unit where the facilities are available. And also suspect placenta accreta in cases where there is a previous cesarean section and now the placenta is located anteriorly. So always in your consent, include the consent for a massive hemorrhage, shock, need for ICU management, need for ventilation. And um, in any worse situation where we cannot uh, manage the bleeding, the ultimate result will be to do a hysterectomy. So in all cesarean sections for placenta previa, the consent should include the risk of hysterectomy, though it is going to be very, very rarely done. What are the other complications that we see? Maternal complications like massive hemorrhage, shock, postpartum hemorrhage, placenta accreta, and increased operative delivery. Whereas fetal complications include malpresentation. Prematurity is usually hydrogenic. Um, they don't go into preterm labor as such, but because of the massive hemorrhage, we tend to induce them or do a cesarean section much before the lung maturity of the baby. So prematurity is hydrogen. Cord prolapses because of man presentations. They can have a prolapse of the cord when there is a rupture of membranes. And because of massive hemorrhage, when there is hypoxia to the fetus, the fetus may undergo intrauterine death. Placenta accreta syndromes, these are of three types, that is accreta, increta, and percreta. Uh, one, uh, this accreta is the mildest one when it is abnormally adherent to the uterus, that is only the endometrium. But then the muscle is intact, so if it also invades the uterine muscle and goes to the myometrium, then it is called placenta increta. And uh, when it penetrates the uterus and the seosa, sometimes even adjacent organs like bladder, then it is called as placenta percreta. So the risk factors, the main risk factor is placenta previa. Around 10% of them have other than placenta symptoms. More the risk when there is a previous history of cesarean section with placenta previa and the current pregnancy. So every number of cesarean section is a risk factor for increasing the incidence of placenta previa and other than placenta. So previous uterine surgeries or submucous fibro and Asherman syndrome, all these conditions, as I told you, the uterine wall is very defective and so they are at a higher risk of developing placenta previa. Again, the diagnosis is done or suspected with ultrasound and when you do it along with a Doppler, it shows increased vascularity but the confirmation of the diagnosis is usually done by using a MRI. So again, for these patients, what we offer is elective cesarean section at 34 completed weeks. So placental abruption, we'll just see an introduction in this class and then continue in the next class. So nothing but uh, placental abruption is nothing but premature separation of a normally implanted placenta. So here, um, in uh, contrast to placenta previa, here the location of the placenta is very much normal. That is, uh, it is located in the upward uterine segment only, but the premature separation occurs. Usually, the time of separation of placenta is after the delivery of the baby. But here, it is prematurely separated and so it causes bleeding. Incidence is around 0.3 to 1% 1 or 1 in 200 deliveries. It has many types, that is, revealed and concealed 
mixer revealed is nothing but when the bleeding that occurs occurs outside the vagina that is it occurs through the vagina or when the bleeding sometimes get collected behind the placenta it is called concealed sometimes it could be a combination of both so that time it is called mixer so when whole placenta gets separated then it is called total abduction and only if a partially it is getting separated and partially it's still intact it is called partial abruptio placenta so with this uh, introduction i think we can complete and then uh, discuss further in the next class thank you